Unit eight, video number two. I can describe supply side economics. Now, if you're listening saying, oh, I don't really need it about supply side economics, that's an idea during the Great Depression and the New Deal. No, it's an idea that applies to economics today. Before we get to that, let's lay the, the backdrop for what life was like in the 1920s into the 1930s. We talked before about the idea of rugged individualism. The, the concept, the guiding principle of this time was do it yourself. The government's not going to get involved in the economy. The government's going to be laissez-faire in terms of economics. If you want to be successful, it's up to you. You work really hard. You want to invest in the company, it's up to you. If you make a good investment, you can make a bunch of money. If you make a bad investment, if you invest in poor companies or you open a bad business and you lose everything, that's on you. That's your decision. That's up to you. Don't come crying to the government. Don't ask the government to help you out when you win and don't ask the government to take your money away if you're doing well. The government's not going to tax you a bunch, but the government's also not going to bail you out. The government's not going to get involved in business. That's the idea of rugged individualism. It's up to the individuals and the individual businesses to do that. The government's going to run the military. The government's going to run the police. The government's going to run the schools. It's going to do its basic jobs to protect our rights and give us basic services. In terms of business, that's not the government's job. At least that's not what it was believed to be during this time period. No government help. The government's not giving free lunch. The government's not doing food stamps. That's up to you, the individual. You, the individual, make the choices of what you do with the money that you earn. You can spend that money on your groceries or not. It's up to you. It's not for the government to do this. The government's not going to get involved. The government's not going to tax you very much. You keep your money, you spend the money. The government's not going to give you health insurance. If you choose to spend your money on health insurance and you get sick, then good. If you decide, nah, 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 I'm going to go buy a car. I'm going to spend my money on a car. And then you get sick. You say, it's up to you. That's on you. The government's not involved. They're not going to tell you what to buy and what not to buy. The government's not going to buy things for you. Rugged individualism. It's up for you to make choices with your money. Today, we're the complete opposite. The government's very involved in your choices. The government will buy health care for you. The government will buy school for you. The government will buy food lunch. The government will buy food stamps. They'll make these decisions for you. And since they're making the decisions for you and most of us, then they're going to have to take money from people to make these decisions. Back then, the government did not take your money as much as it does today. And so the government did not make these purchases for you. It was up to you. If you want to buy a car and not feed your kids, hey, that's your decision to make. But if your kids are starving, don't come to hell us. It's rugged individualism. It's up to you, the individual, to make the best choices. And and the beauty of this system is if you make really good choices, then odds are you're going to do really well. And if you make bad choices, well, then it's probably going to be bad for you. It's up to you. And at the end of the day, there's no one to complain about. There's no one to cry to. You made the choices. You deal with them. So knowing the rules of the game that, hey, if I make good choices, things work out. If I make bad choices, things go the wrong direction. So the incentive is to make good choices. Whereas today we have government support. So you can make bad choice after bad choice after bad choice today. And the government's always going to be there to help you out. That's one of the criticisms of government help and one of the defenses of rugged individualism. If you're always bailing people out, they never learn their lesson. And if you stop bailing people out and you stop helping people out, then they got to figure it out. They learn and they get better. They get stronger. That would be the defense. The criticism is you can't just let people starve to death. You got to help them out. If someone's sick and dying of cancer and they can't pay their bills, then we should help them out. We can't let them die. It's not right. It's a decent point. We've got to find a balance in between the two. Now, it's easy to support rugged individualism when times are good, when it's easy to support yourself. But when the economy crashes and there are hard times and you can't support yourself, then maybe the government should help you out. Today, 20% of the U.S. is on food stamps. You can see the increase. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it is what it is. One in five Americans cannot buy their own food. The government must buy their food for them. And kids shouldn't starve. But the bigger idea is that's not good when one in five Americans is not able to buy their own food and the government has to help them out. That does not sound like a very efficient country. That does not sound like a well-oiled machine. It doesn't sound like the economy or America is doing very well when one in five people can't buy their own food and they have to have the government buy it for them. 
So here are the two conflicting thoughts that we run into when we talk about government assistance, when we're comparing rugged individualism versus the government support. Remember, when we're looking at the 1920s and 1930s, government assistance, government help, it does not exist. It exists today. But we're trying to understand a world where there wasn't government help because maybe Someday in the future, we're going to be back there where there isn't government support. So we want to be able to understand the past, to understand the way it is today, to find the best formula or the best recipe for how to have a good economy and have a strong America. The argument for government help is the idea that if we have assistance, if we help people during hard times, if we give food stamps to one in five Americans, the reason we're doing that is to help them during the hard times, we get them back on their feet, so they can get back to work and then they don't need the government's help anymore. That's the idea of government support. That's the idea of government assistance. We'll help you out when you can't pay for it on your own. When you can't pay for health insurance, we'll help you out. Then you'll get a job, you're earning money, then you can buy it on your own. We'll buy you groceries when you can't buy them. And then when you're back working, we get you back on your feet. We get you through the hard times, then you can pay for it on your own. These are not permanent programs. This should not be permanent. We'll just give it to you, help you out during the hard times, then you get back on your feet. And when you're back on your feet, we'll help the other people that need help. And when we get them on the feet, then we can help the other people. But we cannot have a program that's helping everybody all the time because we can't afford that. Now, that's a fantasy that never has really existed. That's in a perfect world, it's a dream though. It really is a dream that, hey, we're just gonna give you free food and, and free rent and free stuff. And then we're gonna say, get a job and you're gonna get a job. And like, all right, you can keep the free stuff. I'm working on my own. It doesn't really happen that way. That's a dream, that's a fantasy. It would be great if there was this world where I'm the government's gonna help you out for a little bit. And then when your life turns around and everything's great, you'll say, here government, you keep all that free stuff. I don't need that free stuff anymore. You know what I wanna do? I'm gonna go pay for my own stuff. I'm gonna pay for my own food. I'm pay for my own health insurance. I'm going to pay for my own rent. It doesn't happen that way. Once people get free rent and free health care and free food, it's very hard for anyone to say, yeah, I don't want that anymore. All that free stuff, I don't need that anymore. Just it's, it's, it's a fantasy. It really is. And it's not an, an, an indictment on anyone. It's just the way that it is. It's hard to forfeit free stuff. The reality is one in five Americans are on food stamps because they've been on that fat food stamps for a long time. Americans never get back to work and they rely on the government for the rest of their lives. And so we get so far removed from rugged individualism. We get completely removed from it. The idea of, hey, take care of yourself. And that's a great idea. But once the government starts helping, it's very hard to ever help yourself again. That's the reality. That's the hard truth. That's uh, the only way to have rugged individualism is you got to cut people off and you got to go back to work and you got to rely on the individual. Maybe there's a comfortable balance between these two, but we never seem to get it because this is the fantasy and this is often the reality, unfortunately. Supply side economics. This is the theory that we should make it easier to make goods. So we're working with the supply, the amount of something, the making of the goods, the supply of cars, the supply of computers, the supply of iPhones. We're not focusing on the demand for, for iPhones. We're not focusing on the consumer, the, purchase, the person purchasing the goods. We're not focusing necessarily on the government. We're focusing on, in supply side economics, the, the producers, the, the companies that supply the goods that make the supply of goods. Here's how this works. We want to make it easier to make goods. That's the focus of supply side economics. Why? If it's easier to make goods, then we'll make more goods. If we make more goods, the supply goes up. And as supply rises, we know this in economics that price drops. And if price drops, then people will be able to buy more. If people buy more, then the suppliers, the producers will make more. If they make more, then they've got to hire more workers. And if there's more workers, then there's more people buying things and the economy just goes up and up and up and up and up. And how did this start? It started by making it easier to make goods. By increasing the supply of goods, all of these chain reactions happen and the economy does well. So the crux or the impetus of this is to make it easier to make goods and get all of this process started. How do we do that? How does the government now get involved? Well, it's actually by the government not getting involved is going to be the answer. How do we do it? Well, let's figure out how we're gonna do this. Supply side economics, how? How can we make it easier to make more factories and make more cars and more cars? Um, 
the supply will go up, price goes down, the buy more, and if they buy more, they have to make more. If they make more, they got to hire more workers. If there's more workers, there's more buying going on. Wow, it just goes on and on and on. How do we get this started? Well, we've got all these rules and regulations on business and how they have to uh, fall within the law and certain things that businesses have to do. And often all these regulations that businesses have to follow and all these rules, just like in, in, in your life, when you have to follow a lot of rules and regulations in life or in any game or in school, you takes away your freedom. And when we take away freedom, it makes it difficult to do certain things. It makes it more challenging to do things. It makes it more challenging to produce. If we take away the rules and regulations and we free you up and let you just go after it and get it done, you can often produce more. You can often create more. You can often make more. Same thing for businesses. If we take away a lot of the rules and restrictions and regulations on business, and we just let them do their thing, then they'll do their thing. That's how we make it easier for them to make goods. And if it's easier, they can make more. And if they make more, supply goes up. And if supply goes up, price goes down. Once the price goes down, people buy more. If they buy more, they make more. And if they make more, they have to hire more workers. And if they have to hire more workers, then those workers are going to spend more money. And it just goes up and up and up. And how do we do it? The government decides less business regulation. This is called laissez-faire economics, which is, means it's French for hands off. The government is hands off. We talked about this before. Let the businesses do their thing. Government, don't get involved in the economy. Let them do their thing. Now, there can be drawbacks to this, obviously. When you let businesses be unregulated, they can make poor choices. They can make dangerous products. That's a conversation for another day. For the pro side of arguing for supply side economics, you can realize how this can benefit the economy. Perfect example. How much money could we save if we didn't have to wear these dumb outfits? That money they save means it would be less expensive to make the goods. And if it's less expensive to make the goods, we lower the price, then they can sell more and they sell more. And you know how that goes. And the only way that they can lower the price is if it becomes cheaper and easier for them to make whatever this is, potato chips. If it were cheaper and easier for them to make potato chips, if it was cheaper and easier to make potato chips, then they could charge less. And if they charge less for potato chips, they probably would sell more. And if they sell more, then they got to start hiring more workers. And now you got the workers are getting a paycheck and they're buying potato chips and just goes up and up and up. And that happens by deregulation. Obviously there's drawbacks because if you take away the mask, and you take, then you could make some unsanitary products. There are two sides of this. It's social studies, welcome to this world. There's never gonna be a right and wrong. Supply side economics, more good. So we increase the supply from supply line one to supply line two. As supply increases, price drops. As price drops, People will buy more. They're going to sell more goods. We went from selling a quantity of one to selling a quantity of two. Why did we sell more? Because we increased the supply and that meant the price dropped. Cheaper, just like this. If it's $10 for a pizza, maybe you buy it. If it's $5 for a pizza, more people are likely to buy it. The more pizzas that we are selling and making, are going to hire more workers. And you know how this is going to go. That's supply side economics. We need more factories. How do we get the more factories? We talked about this in the previous video. We need more investors. We can get the money from the investors to the business, to the corporation. We need the investors to invest in the corporation. When the corporation gets the money, they can build more factories. We've got to make it easier to get this done so that we can get more factories. More factories means more goods. More goods means higher supply, which means lower price, which means they sell more, which means we have to hire more people. And it goes up and up and up. And the key in supply supply side economics is we need less regulation. We need to deregulate. We need laissez-faire economics. We got to make this process cheaper. So we take away some of the rules in terms of investing, make it easier to invest. Some people will know that, hey, you can have some problems here because we can lead to some bad investments and some gambling in the stock market, which can lead to collapsing the economy. We're setting the backdrop for the Great Depression. We're setting the backdrop for the New Deal and current times. This is the good. I mean, obviously, this is going to help out supply side. Economics can happen through deregulation. It can really boost the economy. But by taking away the rules and regulation and giving people absolute freedom, sometimes they make bad choices. Sometimes they make bad bets. And if enough people make bad bets, you can absolutely destroy the economy and lead to the Great Depression, which you can see right here. Now, that's not the main cause, but we're setting the backdrop of how did we kill the economy? How did the economy get killed? A lot of people were involved. And one of those things is going to be supply side economics and slightly some deregulation of the economy. And it's also something that we're going to see similar here in 2008. Not completely the cause, but one of the culprits of killing the economy is going to be deregulation. Not that deregulation is bad. 
This is not evil. It's just moderation. We don't want a complete Wild West. We don't want no rules, but some rules are too much. Again, there's never going to be a black and white binary option, good and bad, evil, and, and right and wrong. It's going to be kind of balancing those two out. And unfortunately, throughout U.S. history, we're almost always going to swing too far to the right, too far to the left, back to the left, back to the right, pendulum, pendulum, pendulum. When what we need to do is try to find out where we need to be. We don't want too much regulation. We don't want too little regulation. We're going to find the perfect balance of regulation. Supply side economics work but we can't go too far in deregulating. So, and then you can see the crashes that we're gonna talk about in the upcoming videos. Hopefully you have a good idea of how supply side economics works and the, the general feeling of America during that time under the concept of rugged individualism.